reading this morning from Luke's Gospel in chapter 23. Let's share the word of God. Then the whole multitude of them arose and led him to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. Then Pilate asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him and said, It is as you say. So Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no fault in this man. And they were the more fierce, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee to this place. When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked if the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. Now when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he had desired for a long time to see him, because he had heard many things about him, and he hoped to see some miracle done by him. Then he questioned him with many words, but he answered him nothing. And the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. Then Herod, with his men of war, treated him with contempt and mocked him, arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him back to Pilate. That very day, Pilate and Herod became friends with each other, for previously they had been at enmity with each other. Then Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, said to them, You have brought this man to me as one who misleads the people. And indeed, having examined him in your presence, I have found no fault in this man concerning those things of which you accuse him. No, neither did Herod, for I sent uh, sent you back to him, and indeed nothing deserving of death has been done by him. I will therefore chastise him and release him, for it was necessary for him to release one to them at the feast. And they all cried out at once, saying, Away with this man! And released to us Barabbas, who had been thrown into prison for a certain rebellion made in the city and for murder. Pilate, therefore, wishing to release Jesus, again called out to them. But they shouted, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Then he said to them the third time, Why? What evil has he done? I have found no reason for death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. But they were insistent, demanding with loud voices that he be crucified. And the voices of these men and of the chief priests prevailed. So Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they requested. And he released to them the one they requested, who for rebellion and murder had been thrown into prison. But he delivered Jesus to their will. Turn again to that passage that we read a little earlier. Luke chapter 23, verses 1 to 25. C.S. Lewis once wrote a book, a collection of essays, entitled God in the Dock, that is, God on Trial. And in Luke 23, these opening verses, we have an account of the trial of Jesus when he was facing charges. And just as when you attend a court, you are confronted by various characters, so here we find various characters playing their part in the trial of Jesus. Um, So, who do we see? First of all, we see Pilate here, don't we? And in a striking way, we hear him speak and tell the truth about Jesus. Luke seems to make a point of underlining for us how Pilate stresses the innocence of Jesus. And in in that... uh, Luke is quite distinct, I suppose, from Mark and from Matthew, who indicate that Pilate does say something about Jesus being innocent, but Luke really drives the point home. Three times, he tells us, Pilate refers to the innocence of Jesus. In verse 4, Pilate said to the chief priests and to the crowd, I find no fault in this man. Verse 14, 
He said to them, You have brought this man to me as one who misleads the people. And indeed, having, having examined him in your presence, I have found no fault in this man concerning those things of which you accuse him. No, neither did Herod. And then in verse 22, Then he said to them the third time, What evil has he done? I have found no reason for death in him. So here is Pilate, Pontius Pilate, declaring the truth about Jesus. And the truth about Jesus that Pilate states three times is the innocence of Jesus and the fact that there was no basis for a charge against him. So here is Pontius Pilate behaving like an evangelist, declaring truth about Jesus Christ. And yet though Pilate knew the truth about Jesus, and though he openly spoke the truth about Jesus, there is nothing, is there, in this account that gives us any room to think that this truth concerning Jesus benefited Pilate in any way. You see, you can know truth. You can know truth about Jesus, and yet it may be of no value to you, no worth to you. Soon after the beginning, uh, soon after the end of the First World War, there was a German engineer called. Albert Scherbius, he invented a machine called the Enigma machine. It was able to encrypt messages so that they couldn't be read by anyone who didn't possess such a machine. And he began to sell it around Europe. He tried to sell it into Britain. In fact, some companies did buy it. And it was patented in our country, and a patent giving detailed descriptions of how the machine worked, was lodged in the patent office in London. If you know anything about the Second World War, you know how that machine was used by German intelligence and the military. And for a great deal of time, there were many mathematicians in our country who spent a great deal of time trying to decipher the codes that were Uh, produced by that Enigma machine. All the effort that had to go to to break that code. Can you imagine the disbelief that was felt when after the war they discovered in a file in London a complete description of how the machine worked? Britain possessed vital information at that time, but it sat unused. It was of no use whilst it was in that file. And in a similar way, you can know certain truths about Jesus Christ. But it's one thing to possess the truth. It's one thing to know about Jesus. It's another thing for that truth to be of any benefit to you, to do you any good if it is not being acted upon. Pilate, when, when you look at him, when Jesus is on trial, when you look at Pilot, you see that it is possible to know the truth about Jesus Christ, but if it is not mixed with faith in Jesus Christ, it will not benefit you. And that ought to serve very much as a warning to us. It's possible to live a long life, even a religious life, not necessarily a religious life, but it's possible to do this, to accumulate a great deal of knowledge about Jesus to attend public worship, to sit at his table with his disciples and not to know him and not to benefit at all from his saving grace. Pilate knew about Jesus, but it did him no good. And then we see Herod, this second character, and we see that he meets with the silence of Jesus, verse 6 and following. Now, this Herod is Herod Antipas. This isn't Herod the Great of whom we read in the Nativity stories in Matthew 2. This is his son. He reigned in Galilee uh, from about 4 BC to AD 39. And Jesus brought Herod joy and peace. He brought him joy, we are told, because for a long time Herod had wanted to see Jesus And he was, the Bible says, exceedingly glad when he heard that at last he is going to get a chance to hear Jesus and to see him. And Jesus brought him peace, useless peace, because 
That day, we're told, Herod and Pilate became friends, and there was peace between them instead of their old enmity. How ironic it is that Jesus should bring Herod peace, utterly useless peace for him, that would not do him any good at all in the day of judgment. But Jesus, in one sense, did bring him joy and peace. But Herod was delighted to see Jesus, and he was glad that Pilate had sent Jesus to him, we're told. In verse 8, we're told that from what he had heard about Jesus, he hoped that he would witness, he would see Jesus perform some great miracle. And so he kept questioning him, but Jesus gave him no answer. He met with silence from Jesus. There was a time when Herod heard the word of God. This Herod Antipas we're told of in Mark chapter 6. He heard God's word from a man called John the Baptist. Herod had taken as a, uh, taken uh, the wife of his brother Philip, her name was Herodias, and he was living in an incestuous relationship with her. And John the Baptist had the gall to say to Herod Antipas, it is not lawful for you to have your husband's wife. He declared the word of God to him. Well, he just couldn't do that with Herod, and so he threw John into prison. And Herodias held on to a grudge against John because of what he had said, and she was determined that she would see him dead. But Herod, we are told, feared God, uh, feared John, because he knew that he was a righteous and a holy man, and so he wouldn't do any more to him. In fact, Herod was, in a strange way, attracted to John the Baptist. We are told that whenever he heard John, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. It's as if it bothered Herod to listen to John, to hear the word of God through him, and yet at the same time he was being attracted to this truth. So he was repulsed by it, and he was afraid. And yet at the same time, he just had to hear what John had to say. But then the day came when he threw a party on his birthday for the court, and Salome, the daughter of Herodias, danced for him, and the wine had been flowing, and Salome came in, and she stirred things up with her provocative dance, and Herod was so excited by it all that he gave this promise that she would have anything she asked for up to half his kingdom, which, of course, was a proverbial, a proverbial saying. What he was actually saying is just about anything that you want, not literally half the kingdom, but ask for virtually anything. And so she asked her mother, and then she returned with the request for the head of John the Baptist on a platter and Herod's embarrassed but what can he do all the great people of the kingdom are there at the banquet they're all present they'd all heard what he had said they all heard what she had asked for so the order is given bring his head on a platter and the grisly deed is done but if you like Herod you can get over that You see, we've got a way, haven't we, of talking to our conscience. And if you have to do something, you can do it. And we know that the guilt will subside. We can sear our conscience like that. Herod was able to do that. It didn't bother him too much. He didn't want to do it, but it's done now. There's nothing to be gained by brooding over it. So we just move on. And now it's Jesus, the Son of God himself, who is brought before him. And he wants to see him because he's heard a lot about him. But he doesn't hear the word of God from him. He meets with silence. The silence of Jesus. Because Jesus hasn't got a word to say to Herod Antipas. You see, Herod was curious about Jesus. He had heard a lot about him, and he was hoping that Jesus would provide for him the the entertainment of the day, that he would put on a bit of a show, and there'd be a bit of razzmatazz. Herod had heard about all these miraculous powers of Jesus, and he wanted to see it for himself, as if the Son of God has come into the world to entertain us. 
to amuse us, to titillate us a little with a few tricks, as if that's why he's come. And so Herod is curious about Jesus, but he's not serious about him. It's a long time since he was ever serious about hearing God's word. But he's interested enough to see a miracle. He wants Jesus to entertain him. And so he meets with silence. And we have to watch that, don't we? Because any time we try to use Jesus, we are probably going to be disappointed by him. Herod certainly was. He was very disappointed. Jesus didn't even have a word for him, let alone a miracle. And in the end, he's so irritated with Jesus that it's Herod himself who leads the way in mocking Jesus and ridiculing him and getting his guards to join in in that process. Here was one who said that he was a king. And look at him. Look at him just standing there, helpless and silent and weak, standing there in front of me. Is this a king? It's ridiculous. And so, so in mockery and ridicule, he sends Jesus back to Pilate. And we're told they put a dazzling royal robe onto him, a gorgeous robe. It was all a great joke. You see, the problem with Herod was that he had certain expectations of Jesus, certain ideas about what Jesus must be like if he is a king. Why does he mock him? Why does... Why does he say he's a king, Herod's thinking? If he was a king, surely he's going to assert himself. He will prove it. He will uh, demonstrate it. He will give a sign of it. He'll perform a miracle. He wouldn't surely just stand there looking at me, saying nothing to me. Just look at him. You can just see that he's not a king by looking at him. That's how Herod would react. But appearances can be deceiving. If you had stood in the palace at Constantinople on Christmas Day in 1820, you would have seen the newly crowned emperor, Byzantine emperor, Michael II. He sat on the throne of the Caesars in a gorgeous robe, and with a golden crown on his head and his feet in shackles. What would you have made of that picture? How would you have understood what you were looking at on that occasion? See, what had happened was the previous emperor, Leo V, had decided that Michael must die, and he put him in prison, but decided that the execution wouldn't take place until after Christmas. But on Christmas morning, as he was celebrating Christmas in the chapel of St. Stephen, Leo V was assassinated, and Michael was declared the new emperor. But there was no time to find anyone to take the shackles from his feet, so he was proclaimed emperor, crowned and sat on the throne, still in chains. Appearances can be very deceiving. And what if you had seen What if you had seen Michael on Christmas Eve? What what would you have thought of him then? Just because Jesus stands in apparent weakness and in silence doesn't mean that he's not the king that he claims to be. But Herod couldn't see that because you have to have divine insight to see who Jesus is and to penetrate through mere appearances. Herod faced the silence of Jesus who did not live up to his expectations, and so he rejected him. Now, you might be thinking, but I'm a Christian believer, and I I don't take up Herod's position. But still there's instruction here that we should receive from the way that Herod reacts to this situation, because even Christian believers can make the same mistake and fall into the same trap as Herod in this sense. Isn't it true that we can sometimes build up in our own minds a certain expectation of what kind of Lord Jesus should be? That we build up certain expectations of how he should handle the affairs of our lives 
and how he should direct our lives and what he should be doing for us, that we build up these expectations. And so we set in our mind a certain standard that we think Jesus has to comply with and fit into, and when he doesn't fit the mold we set for him, we're disappointed with him. Isn't it true that sometimes we can have the wrong expectations of the kind of Lord we have rather than having Christ as the Christ he is? We are sometimes foolishly taken up with trying to force him to act according to our dictates and our expectations. When Herod tried that, he was met with silence. And then, briefly, there's a third character I want us to look at here, and it's Barabbas. And in Barabbas, we can see the liberty, the freedom that Jesus gives. Now, down through history, as people have sought to teach and to explain what Jesus did on the cross in his death at Calvary, uh, what we call the atonement, uh, a number of theories have developed as to what the atonement is as they try to explain the death of Jesus on the cross. One such theory is called the moral, the moral influence theory. Uh, and the man who propounded it said that the death of Jesus was a manifestation of God's love, that God in the cross shows how far he is willing to go. That the death of Jesus doesn't actually pay the penalty for sin, uh, uh, but it shows that he was willing to enter into the full experience of human suffering. And he does this so this theory suggests, so that when we see God's love in that, our hearts will be softened and we respond to it with repentance and faith. Well, there's a little bit of truth in that theory, and there is a lot of error too. But it's a theory of the atonement, and there are four or five others also. But then there's what someone has once called the Barabbas theory of the atonement, which is based on verses 18 to 25 of this passage. And it is simply this, as it says there in verse 25, And he released to them the one they requested, who for rebellion and murder had been thrown into prison, but he delivered Jesus to their will. Barabbas would have to say that he gained his freedom the text in verse 16 through to 25 uses the verb released five times. Barabbas would have to say, I was released because Jesus took my place. Now, I doubt that Barabbas ever said that because I doubt Barabbas ever stopped to think about that. But in this exchange of Jesus for Barabbas, you see one of the key elements of what happens in the death of Jesus. Barabbas deserved to die. We're told that in verse 19. He was justly imprisoned, and according to the law of the land, he would have been justly executed. But Barabbas is released, you might say, because Jesus took his place. Jesus was substituted for Barabbas. Now, the Christian believer, though he knows that Barabbas probably gave no thought to that at all, or thought of Jesus' death as in any way redeeming him, the Christian believer knows that this lies right at the heart of what Jesus has done for us, that Jesus' death has given us freedom from our sins and their punishment, and that we have this because he was a substitute who took our place. The story is told of a farmer who lost his barn to a fire. It was all burned to the ground and everything that had been in the barn. And his pastor went to visit him and as they were walking through the charred remains, uh, they came to a carcass of a hen and the farmer just nudged it with his boot and to his surprise, out came three chicks. The hen could have escaped from the barn, but it stayed and it was roasted in the fire and it had done so to protect the chicks. Well, that's a simple story. And it illustrates a truth that most of us 
knew before we came here this morning. But on a day like Good Friday, it's an important thing that we put ourselves as it were, in Barabbas' shoes and that we see how true it is that the Lord Jesus took our place in order that we might be set free. And there's something that you can do this morning that Barabbas didn't do, which is to respond to that with faith and worship. The Apostle Paul could never get over it, could he? In Galatians 2.20, Paul says that he, the life he now lives, he lives by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Do you see what Paul is doing there? He moves from the statement of fact to worship. It's as if the very mention of what the Son of God did for him, well, he couldn't speak about it without falling down in amazement and saying, he did that for me. He's the Son of God, he says, but that's not just a cold statement of fact for Paul. It spills over into worship, and he cannot but adore him. The Son of God, who loved me, and who gave himself for me. I hope that you can stand in Barabbas' shoes this morning and see, in the most literal sense, that Jesus Christ is your substitute. And I hope that will lead to worship. So consider Jesus on trial. And be careful that you don't merely know the truth in a literal sense, that you just know the truth about Jesus without that ever being mixed with faith. And as you think of the silence of Jesus before Herod, remember that the silence was a refusal to meet false expectations of him. And as you see the freedom and the deliverance that Jesus gives, well, may that lead us all to worship. The Lord bless his word to us.